All right, hello, folks. Uh, welcome to today's digital exchange conversation. My name is Matthew Fluharty. I'm the executive director of Art of the Rural, and we are really glad to have you all with us today. And we're so excited to have these four panelists. Uh, before we begin, I thought maybe I'd offer a little bit of context uh, for today's digital exchange. Um, in, in 2016, with the support of the National Endowment for the Arts, Art of the Rural and the Rural Policy Research Institute launched Next Generation, which was an initiative focused on bridging conversation, collaborations, and cross-sector network building within the rural creative placemaking field. And Next Generation operates through three interlinked activities. On one hand, uh, cross-sectional regional networks, a digital exchange learning commons that folks can check out at ruralgeneration.org, and a national rural creative placemaking summit um, the inaugural meeting of that summit took place last year in Iowa City and brought together 300 folks from 38 states uh, to talk and think through the future of the rural creative placemaking field. Then uh, to build upon all of that collective energy and uh, to, to continue to spark an evolving national dialogue, um, these, rural, these rural digital exchanges are seeking to draw on the power of connection to further conversation across regions, sectors, and place-based philosophies. Uh, that are so essential to the future of our rural places. So roughly every three weeks, these digital exchanges occur and they offer folks a chance to come together and, and engage with leaders across a range of uh, different disciplines and sectors. Each of these digital exchanges feature three to four voices from across the country. And um, in general, we'll share a specific theme, challenge, or opportunity in our one hour uh, block of time together. And um, should be said, although this is a uh, webinar, our hope is that like this really is a very unwebinary webinar where we can just talk about new ideas and improvise and just just brainstorm and build some connections that can kind of cross the various geographic um, distances that we all share in our work. Um, with with that said, I want to point folks' attention to the Zoom bar real quickly here. Um, so, folks, if you Bring your cursor down to the very, that very lower level horizontal area. We'll see a couple features that'll come in handy for this conversation today. Uh, the first of which will be the chat function, which is the little uh, comic book thing that's right there. And um, as, as our conversation evolves today, uh, we'll be sharing important links from our panelists' uh, work for everybody to check out. If you guys have comments um, to share as this dialogue emerges, feel free to just drop those in right there as well. Uh, and also, two spaces to the left, you'll see a little sort of folder icon with the Q&A. Um, as our panelists are um, sharing their work and uh, discussing things, please feel free to drop questions in uh, to that box right there. Um, the way our conversation works today is we have about um, 20 minutes for introductions, 20 minutes for a conversation between our panelists, and then the closing 20 minutes will be for Q&A with uh, folks who are tuning in today uh, from around the field. Uh, so really, really grateful to have um, everybody joining us uh, today in the audience. Thanks for taking some time out of your busy days to be with us. We're really excited to have you all. Um, and just in closing, this digital exchange uh, that you guys, uh, that we're all enjoying today, this conversation, uh, was created in partnership with the Rural Policy Research Institute and is made possible through the support of the National Endowment for the Arts and the McKnight Foundation, uh, two entities which have really been tireless advocates and friends of rural work all across the country. Uh, this digital exchange is produced at the Outpost Collaborative Space in Monona, Minnesota, which is national headquarters of Art of the Rural. So really, without further ado, we are so excited to have these four folks with us today. We have Shane Hale from the city of Cortez, Colorado, Debbie Moreno from Galesburg on Track, Jason Nieces from the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, and we're so excited to uh, welcome today our moderator, Caitlin Davison, from the Orton Family Foundation. And uh, without further ado, I will pass the mic to Caitlin. Thanks. Super. Thank you, Matt. And thanks to Savannah and everybody else who's behind these great events. Um, we're so delighted to be here with you today and really to be able to share the work of Community Heart and Soul and great towns and partners and communities that are really doing some creative things when it comes to community development. Um, so I'm going to speak for just about five minutes and in that time give you a little bit of background on the foundation and also just a brief overview of Community Heart and Soul, which all of our other panelists have 
direct experience with, and you'll hear about that in just a little bit. Um, but first, I will answer the question that is on all of your minds, which is, where am I? <laughs> and so I do, I live in a yurt, and I work from home. And I live in a fairly rural part of Maine. For those of you who know Maine, I'm just north and west of Portland. And I live on an old dairy farm. So I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and moved here about three or four years ago. So rural life is fairly new to me. Small town life is fairly new to me. But I really, I love living in a small place. I love going to the little market down the street and seeing people who I know. Um, and I also know some of the frustrations of really coming together as a community in a small town, making decisions, and bridging some of those divides that can be either longstanding or um, new divides as things change. So I hope you're inspired today by some of the conversation that we have and that you see things that apply to your work and that can really be relevant to the small town or the rural community that you live in. Um, so first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Orton Family Foundation, and we have been around since 1995. We're an operating foundation, and that just means essentially that we don't make grants, but we see that our philanthropy is in the work that we do and our staff time and the resources that we create. Um, and so a lot of our work is done through partnerships. You'll hear about some partnership work with um, Jason, who's with the Community Foundation of Greater Disease when he speaks. But really, our mission is to help small cities and towns become more socially, culturally, and economically vibrant places. And we believe the best way to do that is by empowering residents to come together and make change in their own communities. So we spent about a decade working really closely with communities and people like Shane Hale, who you'll hear from in Cortez, Colorado, to come up with what are some of the best methods and the best process that any town can use to bring people together, get a really broad sense of what matters most to the community, and then make decisions and take action based on that. So that's essentially the essence of community heart and soul. It's a catalyst for positive change in small towns. It actively seeks the collective wisdom of all residents, especially those who have not been involved in decision making in the past. And it serves our mission. It helps to build stronger, healthier, more economically vibrant communities. So it's a resident driven model, as I mentioned, it, that builds trust and it takes into account really the unique character of a town and the deep emotional connections that people feel to that place. And then it builds on those to really create the best possible community for the people who live there. So I'll tell you briefly what the model entails. It is a two-year process, and it's done in four phases. So the first phase is all about getting organized, learning who's in your community and how best to reach them. The second phase is about storytelling. It's about hearing what people care about, connecting to them, building relationships, and doing that work to build trust. And that's where a lot of the creativity comes into play. Um, you have to think about those people who live in the farthest parts of your community, the most rural areas. How do you get them involved? How do you get them to trust you, to tell you what really matters to them about the future of their town? The third phase is about taking action based on those things you've heard from the community. And then the fourth phase is really about saying, okay, it's time to implement the actions that are most important to our community. And then also thinking about how do you sustain this work over time? So what does engagement in the community look like going forward? How do we make sure that community organizations are collaborating, that we're using resources wisely, and that we're continuing to seek out missing voices to be involved in decision making and not just relying on the wisdom of a few. Um, so with that said, I'll introduce our panelists. I'm so excited for you to hear from them. First up will be Shane Hale. He's the city manager of Cortez, Colorado. He is guaranteed to make you laugh. He has one of the best senses of humor I've ever heard. Um, and coming from a community, which I'll tell you more about, but in southwestern Colorado, 
Chestnut is a fairly diverse community. It's near the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation and has fairly significant Hispanic community as well. Um, after Shane, we'll hear from Debbie Moreno, who's with Galesburg on Track in Galesburg, Illinois. Debbie has, her resume has more skills than I've ever seen. She's a poet, an artist, she's a mother of a large family, and you'll just love hearing from her. She's playing the role of project coordinator in Galesburg, and so what that means is that she's paid to really do the volunteer management and project management of their community heart and soul work. Um, and then finally, you'll hear from Jason Nices, who is a heart and soul coach, which means he helps people like Debbie to learn and implement the heart and soul model in their communities. So he's working with the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, and they are in turn helping the communities of Bellevue, Iowa, Monticello, Iowa, um, Mercer County, and maybe he'll even talk about some new ones that are coming on board. Um, so with that said, I'll turn it to Shane to start things off. All right, hey, thanks a lot, Caitlin. Um, uh, thanks for the nice intro. Um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, because I've been involved uh, with the Heart and Soul process, um, both from the inception uh, to the work after, I've actually been working on Heart and Soul for a little over five years. Uh, so it's a bit daunting to boil that down to five minutes. So, so bear with me, I, I will try to be succinct. Um, so again, my name is Shane Hale. I've been the city manager in Cortez since uh, October of 2011. Uh, so I started right before uh, Orton selected the city uh, is to be one of its communities. Uh, and prior to that, I was in Grand Lake, Colorado, which is a, a small uh, mountain community on the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, so between that and uh, my graduate work, I've been in uh, local government for about 15 years now, and yet I'm 25. Uh, and as long as that's zoomed out, you won't know the difference, right? Um, so uh, when I started here in Cortez, um, I discovered it was a lot like like any other community, um, probably a lot like where, where you live. Um, there's a lot of great things here. Um, uh, for example, you can walk in a grocery store and you make eye contact with somebody you've never met before and and they say hello you know it's just it's it's, it's a nice small town um you go to the parks uh, they're full of kids laughing and playing we, we have hundreds of acres of parks here and, and uh, you have a real sense of community uh and then you know you have a lot of nonprofits and charitable organizations and, and people working together uh to, to help out people that aren't as fortunate so um, I, I think in a lot of ways, Cortez is as special as any place. Um, but we also have a lot of issues here. You know, we have um, the issues where people can talk past each other and not really to each other. Um, we have um, any kind of public forum where, where you should, you know, you're adopting a $30 million budget and, and nobody shows up. You, know, you just kind of have this feeling of, of a few people making decisions for everybody. Um, and then Montezuma County, where we live, um, is, is really a poor county. Uh, it's one of the poorest in the state. And so, as many of you probably know, people that are in poverty, uh, they feel disenfranchised. They, they, they don't really feel like they have a voice. Um, so, so those are kind of our, some of our challenges. Uh, by the numbers, uh, Cortez is about 9,000 people. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, we're, we're about 70% white, uh, but we also have a 16% Hispanic and 12% American Indian. Uh, and then we are in Southwest Colorado, we're in the Four Corners region, so we border Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, actually, each state capital is as close or closer uh, than Denver is, so that's how uh, isolated we are. Uh, so with that as a backdrop, in 2012, we started um, to kind of climb out of the recession. Um, we were really thinking, okay, well, when the next wave of development comes, you know, is that gonna shape us? You know, or, or are we gonna kind of help and be proactive and determine um, how this community grows. Um, and, and with all that as a background, we entered into the Hard Soul Project. Um, so the first thing we did is we established a CAT team, which is a citizen advisory team. And that really consisted of uh, different uh, um, local nonprofits, I guess kind of key community stakeholders, and, and other key institutions. And so we got all these leaders together. Uh, they basically acted as a steering committee for us. Um, and, and our strategy was pretty simple. You know, we know that people aren't going to come to the public hearing, so we need to go to them. And so um, we, we went to tons of different things, but just a few examples, uh, like 4th of July, you may have a big 4th of July uh, show in your town. We certainly do here. 
So we just set up a tent and we just talked to people. You know, we also, um, our summer fest, we figured people are drinking. They're going to probably be a little bit loose lipped while they're drinking. Let's go and talk to them. Um, and then kind of our third strategy, we're like, um, we have community barbecues. Um, we always know that if uh, you kind of feed people, uh, they'll show up. And so we did all these outreach efforts and um, we, we kept it really low tech. Uh, we did dot polling, we did paper surveys. Uh, we had people do personal stories on videos. Um, we had them write down their ideas on chalkboard. But really, uh, our, our keys were pretty simple. We would just prompt with a little question, we'd let people talk. And, and out, out of these efforts, we had a lot of themes that came through. And I think, you know, just kind of this community fabric of ideas and, and values. And so, um, well, we've had numerous outcomes, and I certainly can't, can't talk about those. I, I would say that um, the coolest thing about this is that while well, the process officially ended back in 2014, um, the, the hard soul work still continues today. I mean, uh, literally, we've got four major capital projects in our budget this year that came out of the 2012 process and, and really maybe 2012-2013 uh, um, planning. And, and I think the reason why we are still working on heart and soul and the reason why it's still uh, in our vocabulary, uh, really three things that, that we had in our favor. Um, one is, is we engage so many people, I mean, just hundreds of people in the community that there's a lot of accountability there. I mean, you can't, you can't talk to hundreds of people in your community and hear what they have to say and just let it kind of sit uh, on a shelf. Um, secondly, we had a high elected official involvement. Uh, at any one time, we would have three or four of the city council that were actually members of the citizen advisory team. Um, so we had great finance uh, uh, from the elected officials. Uh, and then because we have a fairly stable government here, staff has been pretty consistent as well. And I think just from staff side, because we understand the elected involvement and the um, how many people were involved, um, we keep it in the budget, we keep talking about it. So. Um, that's kind of my, my first push. I look forward to your future questions, and I think I'm uh, now pitching over to Debbie. So thank you. Debbie, sorry to interrupt, but I think you need to unmute yourself. Okay, got it. Thank there you. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I was saying that um, I would echo what Shane has already shared with us. We, although we are in Illinois and he's in Colorado, um, we have some similar issues in our community, um, areas that are really uh, beautiful and outstanding and that we're very proud of. And then we also have parts of the community that really need some, some work. So just a little background on Galesburg. We're a population of about 32,000 people. So we're one of the larger heart and soul communities. Um, our, our demographics just basically laid out are about 10% um, African-American, somewhere around 7% Hispanic, Latino, and then the rest are primarily uh, Caucasian. However, we have an influx of Congolese immigrants, and they have really um, been a wonderful addition to our community. Um, I was sort of asked to talk about the arts. And so um, given everything that Shane has said, I'm just going to kind of add on with this arts piece. So I became the coordinator of Galesburg um, on track or the Galesburg Heart and Soul because I wanted to listen to people's stories. Um, narrative has been at the core of my professional life for the past 25 years as I've worked as a journalist, an essayist, a writing teacher. Um, and then mining a community for its narratives though isn't always so easy. Um, it takes some gumption to approach people cold and ask about their, their life, inquire about their dreams for the future. Um, but as the coordinator of Galesburg on Track, I've gained a perfect excuse to seek out as many stories as possible. Um, our objective is to hear what people have to say about our community. So I don't look for gossipy stories, though sometimes those can be interesting and informative too. But what you know, we are aiming for is to discover what really what people really value about our community. So some of the answers, and we, we've talked to thousands of people at this point from all different avenues of the community. Um, so some of the answers have been kind of straightforward and what you might expect, such as I value clean streets in a beautiful neighborhood. And for others, the answers have felt more difficult. I value a community where my family and I feel included. And what I discovered behind both these kinds of statements 
were often um, painful, painful experiences that people have had. So one was about a disintegrating neighborhood being overrun by violence and drugs. And the residents in that community and that sort of, that was a, a neighborhood of several long blocks, they'd lived there for 40 years and they had slowly seen their neighborhood disintegrate and they refused to move because it was their neighborhood. One that was once loved and clean and safe. And we were hearing from people, you know, we feel scared in our own homes. So that was, um, you know, the story behind we want clean neighborhoods. And then the other statement that um, I heard from one particular story was about discrimination and exclusion. Uh, a local man served his 85 year old mother some takeout food one day. And when she asked where the delicious food had come from, he told her the name of the restaurant and she'd never tasted their selections before because, well, for the decades the restaurant had been there, she hadn't been welcomed because she was black. And the woman told her son, we just knew not to go there. So we have long histories of, of stories and experiences that run deeply. And, and the question is, and has been for us, how do you translate people's stories into art? Or conversely, how do you allow art to become a vehicle for stories? So I have two examples I'd like to share with you um, about how our Heart and Soul initiative has engaged community members by way of culture and creativity. A little before our Communities Heart and Soul project launched, which, and that started around um, 2016, January of that year, a Chicago-based artist um, began painting portraits of regular people in Galesburg. John Baker asked residents to submit photos of themselves and began what he called the portrait project. He explained that kings and queens of old had been painted because of access, money, and importance, but most humans who had ever lived had never had their portraits painted. John therefore sought to honor regular people like those I just told you about in his own fashion. He built small handmade wooden boxes and painted the portraits on one end. As he finished each painting, John stacked it with the others, often in an uneven tipped style. The ultimate effect was a democratizing wall of portraits. People of different shapes, sizes, colors, and ages coming together in a panoply of vivid and magnetic colors. It was a beautiful project to behold, and John loved the idea of heart and soul and welcomed us to partner with him at the opening of his portrait project. So we did that in March of 2016, and our Galesburg on Track initiative officially launched with several hundred people in attendance, and they were all able to witness the beauty of the community by way of John's work. So if you wanna go and see it, um, um, it is posted somewhere, I think, on the, the web chat. Um, a second creative and free-flowing project that our Heart and Soul Initiative used was a traveling chalkboard. So one of our volunteers was left with an oversized chalkboard, and I'm not talking about a little chalkboard. I'm talking about this thing's probably at least eight to 10 feet tall, and it's really wide, and it was built for his daughter's wedding shower. And after the shower, he didn't, our, our volunteer didn't know what to do with this chalkboard. It was just massive. So I said, well, I bet we could use that. And we began um, moving the chalkboard around the community to various events where we were a heart and soul presence. And each time we set up the chalkboard, we wrote different open-ended questions for people to respond to. So one of the questions was, if you were king or queen for the day, what would your community look, or our community look like? Um, and another, on other days, we asked, um, can you name something free to do in Galesburg? And we compiled all of those things. We left a bucket of colored chalk by the board and encouraged people to respond. Each time we used the chalkboard, it filled quickly with col brightly colored ideas, answers, and sometimes drawings. And then we photographed the responses and used them in our data collection. This chalkboard was an unintimidating and fun way to include people in a conversation. A conversation. Eventually, we created a postcard listing 100 free activities to do in Galesburg. And we now distribute that postcard pretty widely throughout the communities, just so people know what others have said. Um, I've also visualized creating a collage with the chalkboard photos, but that's a project for the future. So if you want to look at some of that work we've done that is on our Facebook page, and I think that also is added here to the, the chat. So I love the arts. I live them. My husband's an artist. I'm a writer. All of our kids are involved in the arts in some way. For us, we found it easy to implement, implement creative and vibrant projects. 
So, you know, I know some people are concerned about what their, their community might think. Is it acceptable to do something artsy or different? Is it not going to be taken seriously? Our experience is that it's acceptable to use music, color, shapes, words, color chalk, dance, and even sometimes glitter to engage the public. People love to feel free and to celebrate. And the arts and creativity are perfect vehicles for vitalizing and celebrating one's community. So I am now turning things over to, let me see. Can someone remind me who am I turning this over to? To Jason. <laughs> there you go, Jason, it's all yours. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is Jason Nysis, and as Caitlin mentioned before, I work at the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, and that's a, we cover a seven county region in Northeast Iowa. And we, uh, so, and we have affiliate boards, affiliate foundation boards in each one of those counties. And one reason we started working with uh, Heart and Soul was to give those communities in rural areas ways to uh, connect philanthropy to what matters most to them. Uh, so, and to increase the impact of philanthropy. So uh, we wanted to be sure we had a, a mechanism some tools to give communities a chance to do this for themselves. So we are also very interested in using Heart and Soul to cultivate that next generation of leaders. Uh, often through Heart and Soul, new people find their voice. People who aren't on the school board or the conservation board, the library board, or whatever traditional leadership roles exist in that community find a new voice through Heart and Soul. Uh, so that's that we see that as one of the key deciding factors in successful futures for our rural communities is who are those next leaders. Uh, also working in our region, we want to create a network of innovative communities, uh, communities that are working together on a regional basis to help construct their own preferred future. So I've worked in several different communities with Heart and Soul so far, and one of the things that, uh, so I have a little different perspective than Shane and Debbie, because I've worked with several different ones, and as the arts relate to heart and soul, it's been interesting to see because um, one of the key aspects of heart and soul is that it is an asset-based process. You build upon the assets that already exist in a community to strengthen it and to build upon those things to bring people together around what matters most. So in each community has different assets. So as we looked at arts-based creative solutions for getting people to tell their stories, we really had to um, you know, be, be, get different people at the table based upon who already existed in those communities. Um, one of the more fun projects that we worked on was in Bellevue, Iowa, which is a lovely little town right on the Mississippi River. Um, they have an interesting, they have a very vibrant uh, live music scene there. Uh, several restaurants and bars and things and festivals that focus on live music. And our project coordinator in that town happens to own a bar where they, um, and a music store where they feature live music. So one day we were kind of brainstorming about what we could do that was going to help people in their community uh, tell their stories in a, in a fun, more creative, unexpected way. Uh, beyond the flip charts and the voting dots and all these things that we tend to do when we're at meetings that are super boring and not very don't really reveal uh, real stories. You know, so some of the things that Debbie was talking about show you the creativity that's needed to get people to really tell their stories. So Karen and I were talking about this and we said, geez, you know what we ought to do is we ought to have people contribute uh, song lyrics about Bellevue. Uh, things they'd like to see in a song about Bellevue. So we held several workshops throughout the community with tar with, for the general public, but also for targeted audiences like children and senior citizens and, and newcomers to Bellevue and all these kinds of things. So they started to contribute all of these song lyrics. Karen was then able to take those song lyrics and give them to a group of writers and singers and musicians in her, so in Bellevue, in her community, who could take those ideas and turn them into songs about Bellevue. So they are, uh, at, they are currently, they've recorded, like five of the eight songs have been recorded. They're gonna put them onto CDs, and then they're gonna use that as a springboard for more discussion in the community, but also as a point of pride. 
Uh, these are the things that we care about. Uh, the songs range in topics from, there's a beautiful state park there. There is uh, the river, the Mississippi River is obviously a topic. Uh, every day at six o'clock in the evening, all the bells at the churches in Bellevue ring. So there's a song about the churches of Bellevue. Uh, there's a song about, uh, a kind of a funny song about, so you're new here, why did you come here again? You know, it's kind of like, in a lot of small towns, that's a thing. Like, what are you, why are you here uh, moment? So it's kind of a funny little song. So we're really excited about that project. And that's a project that might not necessarily work in other towns. That's a, something that's very specific to Bellevue. They have the resources and the tools and the musicians and the writers and the singers to make something like that happen. But it's a wonderful um, way for people to tell their stories and give themselves uh, something else to be proud of in their town. Um, in the town where I work, in Dubuque, uh, we've also been using uh, a fun storytelling process called Pachakacha, and some of you may have heard of this. It's a, it's a global phenomenon. It's, it's spelled P-E-C-H-A-K-U-C-H-A, Pachakacha, and it's a way for people to tell their stories uh, in their community. And I think Savannah's got a link that will take you, that she'll post in the chat, uh, a link about how uh, some of the stories that we've done in Dubuque. So it's a public uh, storytelling activity and it's a, got a really specific framework that helps take people who aren't necessarily good storytellers or good public speakers, used to, to public speaking, to frame their story and tell it uh, through PowerPoint slides in a fun, uh, unique way. Um, so we are always looking for methods like that to get people out of their houses, to get people to interact with each other and tell their stories that are really going to be the basis for community change, like how communities identify their values and, and really set a new course for the future. Um, so I think those are, uh, that gives you some food for thought there, and I think I'm going to turn it back over to Caitlin then, who is uh, going to lead us in some Q&A. Super. Thanks, Jason, and thank you all for sharing stories from the communities we work with and live in. Um, we are going to move into the Q&A portion. So as Matt mentioned at the start of the hour, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we invite you to submit questions you might have for our panelists. And we are going to start with some that were pre-submitted. So first, I think all of our panelists did a great job of explaining how Heart and Soul allowed their communities to use more creative, more arts-based methods in having community conversations. And so I want you all to share a little bit more about how that's changed dynamics in your community or, or what have been the results of taking this creative approach to community building and engagement. Um, so Shane, I think I'll turn it to you to start off. I think you're on mute. Oh, there I go. Uh, OK, uh, thank you. So. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, I, uh, so one of the methods that we used um, uh, pretty early in the process, we had a contest called the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and basically, we encouraged people to, to go out and, and take pictures. And, and I can't remember if we issued them Polaroids or not. It's, it's been a few years. But uh, nevertheless, we encouraged people to go out in the community. And, and if you like something, take a picture of it. If, if you don't, take a picture of it. And, and we basically, you know, had this whole collage of pictures come back and, and people just could, could, could put the picture on, on whatever theme they thought that it met. And, and quite frankly, I mean, if it's ugly, it, it's not like it took a lot of interpretation. I think we all agreed to that. Um, but, but it really started us down the path of, of beautification, Cortez. I think really focusing on our aesthetics, on our gateways, on, on our landscaping. And um, so that's resonated through a lot of things. You know, I mentioned earlier we had um, some capital projects we budgeted this year. Um, all of those are kind of thematically um, beautification and improving um, the aesthetics of town. Um, you know, they certainly have arts components to them. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's really, I think, that kind of set us on that course. And I think it was kind of that, that creative approach to uh, getting, pe getting people's comments on what they like about the community that they kind of set us on, on that direction. So does that answer, Caitlin, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. 
great. Um, Debbie, did you have any thoughts about, you talked about some of the tough dynamics in Galesburg. Do you feel like the creative methods that you've all used have started to change the dynamics around some of the race conversations or some of the other challenges in Galesburg? Yes, in that we have been able to implement these arts initiatives all over the community and people everywhere really welcome the, the question, what do you think? Um, they want their voices to be heard. And for some, that's brand new. They haven't been asked that question. So I would say, you know, you don't necessarily have to use the arts, even just simply approaching somebody and asking them genuinely, what do you think about this particular thing? There, we've had a lot of success with that question. And then if you can bring in something, you know, fun and dynamic to accompany that through whatever your, your arts medium is, um, that, that's even better because then people feel like they're part of something. They can say, I did that, that one day when you were there. And then that's how you slowly build buy-in. Does that answer your question? I think that's great. Yeah, it sounds like just the act of asking people for their opinion is one of the things that shifts how the conversation plays out about community and its future. Yeah, Thanks. Absolutely. And Jason, did you have anything to, to add? Mm, no, I think that covers it pretty well. <laughs> Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question I wanted to ask is, I think the reality of community work, and for those of you who are joining us as participants, you know that communities are beautiful places, but they're also messy. And so while Heart and Soul is designed, it's a step-by-step -step process that has these phases. There's a lot of room for learning, for being creative. Um, and so my question is, what are some of the things or an example of something that you didn't anticipate, a place where maybe you needed to do a little bit of course correction because of that nature of community and needing to really be responsive to what the community was saying and what its needs are? Um, Jason, you look really deep in, in thought there. Do you have any comments? Um. Well, I think um, there's there's several levels on which uh, our heart and soul process works. You know, there is the general public, you know, getting all the members of the community. Um, we do a very detailed analysis at the outset of our process to understand who exactly lives in the community, you know, how many older people and how many younger people and how many people living in poverty and how many, you know, Debbie mentioned some of the racial and ethnic uh, uh, groups that we need to make sure that we're involving in our discussions. So there's certainly the work that we do at that level to get everybody at the table, but I think there's another level of education even for your leadership team. And maybe Debbie could even speak to this too, because they're the ones who are meeting monthly or even more regularly than that. And having them as either current community leaders or emerging community leaders to really understand these methods and get them used to this uh, was a real learning curve for them, I think that it's not just about me or the project coordinator learning how to do this stuff. They had to learn how to do this stuff and they had to be conducting these meetings. So I think that took a lot of adjustment uh, within the community is to understand that you're now a leader in this process and you have to take a more active role. And even uh, the amount of education we could do for those emerging leaders about who lives in their community and what's going on. I mean, um, one of the meetings we were at in one of my towns, we were talking about trying to reach people living in poverty, which is a really difficult demographic to reach in many ways. And one of the older fellows uh, sitting around the table said, you know, I think we're trying a little bit too hard to reach this group. Pretty soon they're going to be overrepresented in our data. We're going to get too much information from that group. And we had a, a woman from the school district who was sitting at the table and she said, well, actually, 40% of the kids in our schools get free and reduced lunch. And that fellow kind of had no idea. He had no idea that that was the case. So I think that's the, that those are the kinds of things that come up that you have to adjust to. And uh, I can't think of any specific examples where we really had to change course um, in either of the towns I've worked in to really do something completely differently. But it's just that ongoing acquisition of knowledge about their community helps the team really understand it and themselves better. 
And I think sharing the data back out to the community is always a big challenge too. It's not just telling me or the coordinator or the leadership team. It's like the people in the community have to hear each other's stories. So I think that's an ongoing challenge for most of the towns that I've worked with. Yeah, thanks. And it sounds like there's an element of helping people realize their own agency, that they're mm -hmm. really, as community members, of able to be responsible and accountable to this process and the change they want to see. Thanks. That's great. Um, Shane, did you, I know you're saying it's been a few years since you all did Heart and Soul and Cortez, but looking back, is there anything that you did have to adjust or any lessons learned that you've now applied to engagement going forward? Yeah, I think a, a big lesson learned for us, um, you know, we, you, you mentioned in your intro, Caitlin, that um, we are really close to the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. And so uh, for people on the conference, uh, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe is about 10 miles south of Cortez. Of course, it's a sovereign nation. Uh, it has about, I think, 2,000 residents there. Um, and um, I think the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation uh, takes up about 37% of the county's land. So it's a, it's a large reservation. Um, they're they're um, a fairly poor reservation as well. And uh, we, we really wanted to make a concerted effort to involve them in this process. And so, um, you know, we sent a delegation to Toyok, uh, which is the city they live in, um, a couple times to really engage them and uh, really on, on the entryways and, and how that could be represented from Toyok. Um, and, and we had a few other meetings um, with them in Cortez and heard about all kinds of issues of, um, you know, just kind of this baggage that just still exists. You know, you're, you're listening to this 65 year old grandpa talking about how when he came to school in Cortez, you know, he'd get beat up when he got off the bus or, you know, just these kind of horrible stories. Um, and, and really it just kind of is illustrated to us because we've continued to try to engage the Mount U tribe and uh, council, my council is completely committed to it, um, to really work with the tribe and, and kind of amend those fences. I'll tell you that, that, you know, even a few years out, you know, we still struggle, you know, we still struggle when we say we get just travel council and we'd buy you dinner and, and that didn't work out. And geez, can we bring our city council down to the tribe? we'll still buy dinner, but we'll sit at your table, no response, you know? And so it's just, it's been really slow going. And I think, uh, you know, maybe that lesson learned is just, um, you know, if, if, if these problems came up over 50 years, it, you're not going to solve them in, in, in 50 minutes or, or maybe even in 50 weeks. So I think you just need to have kind of the long game attitude and, and be patient and just kind of, you know, be committed to um, the eye on the prize because it's been, um, I, I think my mayor, Karen Cheek, is, is maybe the most persistent person in the world. And if she can't uh, get them to sit at a table, I don't think anybody could because she's, she's there. You know, she's, she's an active mayor. So I, I think that's my deal is just, you know, kind of it, it, just despite our priorities and despite our, um, our wishes, you know, we, we just can't fix all these problems overnight. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the principles that we work by with heart and soul is playing the long game and recognizing, like you said, there are long-standing divides, a long-standing lack of trust, and that it does take time. So thanks. That's a really helpful perspective. And it, Debbie, any thoughts from you on Galesburg? Yeah, I, I was going to um, give you two things. Uh, there's so much that I could say, but I'm just going to stick to these two comments. One is one of our my surprises is that we continue to come up against people who want measurables. They want deliverables. They want to know what your data says, and they want. They, I mean, they 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 tend to be um, executive minded people who are accustomed to looking at charts. And this is such a different kind of model. And it's taken a while for some of those folks to really get it. Um, others understand the process right away. They think, yeah, of course, this is really natural. So I would say one of our bigger struggles has just getting people to wrap their heads around what this is. Um, and, that, and that we are playing the long game. These kinds of things change, community change happens over time with the involvement of many, many people, not just 
you know, a few. And, and that's what we're shifting away from. So that's kind of been a little bit of a tension point for us in our community. Um, so that was sort of the negative, but I have this really wonderful positive um, that I didn't expect. We have a, um, we have Knox College here, which is a nationally ranked college um, and students come from all over the country, actually all over the world. So we have wonderful representation. And there was one student who was in a Shark Tank kind of class, was a business class where she had to come up with a startup business. And I happened to know her through some other things and she wanted to start a business on, um, on composting. She thought, well, we have restaurants around the community. I'm gonna start a business that moves around and collects the, uh, the trash and then we're gonna compost it. And I said, well, that's a wonderful idea, but I know you and you're a super artistic person and you have so much energy in that part of your life. Why don't you do something around arts? So then she said, okay, I'll think about that. She took all of these furious notes and several months later, she came back with her business model and it was amazing. And she actually has started a business now in Galesburg that she has called the Blue, Blue Brick Collective. And it's an open space for anybody. And they're really trying to target teenagers right now. And there are knitting and crochet classes. They have a writing area. Um, they're right now rehabbing garbage cans that are going to be used throughout the, the city um, with you know vibrant paint, paintings and such. So here was this tiny little idea that she had. And just with a tiny bit of mentoring on my part, um, she turned something, this little idea into something that really has become a reality and is growing now. So um, there are, you know, surprises in every direction, I, I, I say, in this whole project. Oh, thanks, and what a beautiful surprise to have. Um, that actually leads me into a question submitted by someone that was about, I'm going to pull it up here so I make sure I get it right. Um, so they're saying they have a fledgling group hoping to create an arts and entertainment district in their small city or county. And they're looking to figure out how they garner support where there's already so many arts groups in existence. And so Debbie, I'm thinking about the group you just mentioned. I don't know if you have any insight there, but how do they create this new compelling space when there, it sounds like there are already other artists and other art agencies in Galesburg? Well, uh, my suggestion to the student was, and she's actually graduated, so now she's a part of our community, um, to start small. And one of her initial um, projects was to bring together the various arts groups that were that already existed in the community. And she did it on a Saturday morning for two hours and used a very heart and soul kind of method, you know, asking people, okay, what, you know, what facilities, what materials, all, all these things, you know, what do you have available to you as an artist? And what would you like? What don't we have? Where do we need to fill in the gaps? And that started a conversation. It was amazing. I think she had 30 people there on a Saturday morning. And from there, she had a couple more meetings and then slowly evolved into this collective that she's not just doing on her own. She has other people involved as well. Um, and I think that over time, we're going to see this grow into something even bigger. But I, but my husband and I, on a totally separate note, started a business 25 years ago, and our mantra has always been, you know, small steps, baby steps, because if you grow too quickly, you know, there's, it's not always so easy. So I would say that would be my major piece of advice. That's great advice, and then I love the idea of bringing people together and doing some convening to get input before you get started, too. Jason or Shane, did you, I don't know if either of you have experience with art districts, if not, maybe any thoughts generally about how to navigate in our small towns that there are a lot of groups sometimes doing overlapping or similar things. So how does Heart and Soul help with that or mm -hmm. how have you seen that be navigated? Well, as Debbie was talking, one thing did come to mind is it might be helpful to um, find a group and you know I, I just as I'm thinking of putting on kind of my community foundation hat You know one of the things that we try to do in our community is really think about can we be a convener? Can we facilitate discussions even if we're not? Um, necessarily an arts organization Can we be the ones to bring people together in an unexpected way or a unprecedented way? So that might be something to consider is, is there a group like a community foundation or some sort of a more neutral group 
who is dedicated to community betterment, who could bring people together, even though they're from these different arts organizations, and to really facilitate a discussion and foster collaboration. Uh, in Dubuque in particular, we've had great success with public-private partnerships, largely based upon this collaborative model. Like, let's get people together, let's think about our strengths and what we bring to the table and work together towards a common goal instead of uh, this stuff all happening separately in the community on its own. So I think our foundation likes to play that role, so there might be other organizations like that in your community that could help facilitate a discussion. Super, thanks. So there was another question that came in, and Shane, I'm going to turn to you with this one. I was asking about how, thinking about community heart and soul, how have you engaged and worked with elected officials? And so I know, Shane, it's in your role as city manager, that's part of your day-to-day -day is interacting with elected and appointed officials. How did that play out with heart and soul? Okay, yeah, thanks. And, and, and maybe my experience actually won't be as relevant to some people because I am a city manager, so it's not, um, you know, like I need to find somebody at the grocery store and, and, and ask them. Um, but like I mentioned in my presentation, at any one time during the heart and soul process, we would have three to four of our seven elected officials that were active on the community advisory team. And so I, I think we had a really early buy-in from our city council, which was great. I, I think it was a real key to our success. Um, it, following that, um, we did have a, um, uh, every time we do a strategic plan or we sit down with council, I, I've heard time and again that, that uh, council's intent and insistence that, that these values that came through, that these um, investments that the community have made, uh, you know, get codified, they get realized in the city's objective. So, um, you know, from my standpoint, I think that because I had um, such strong early buy-in from council and they've been involved, it's been fairly easy for me to keep that kind of top of mind um, whenever we, we have a proposal or an idea or a, a budget request. Uh, certainly if it came out of heart and soul, I, I bring that back in. I make sure they understand this was um, you know, something that was identified by our community as a priority. Um, but other than that, you know, it's been, I think my experience has probably been easier than most uh, in that respect. Thanks. And it, Jason, if, I think you might have had experience that's a little different from Shane's where there hasn't been that immediate buy-in from city council and local government. So how, has your, how have your teams worked to build that buy-in over time? Um. Well, I think we've always been very careful in both, uh, and actually all three of the communities that I've worked in, to be sure that there are direct linkages between our leadership team and official leadership in the community. Um, now, those folks who are involved might not be the decision makers, it's probably not the mayor or the city manager in some cases, um, but we've always tried to keep one foot in that world at least. Um, I think uh, making sure that there is at least open communication and uh, there is a, uh, an instinct to inform those folks about what's going on and invite their participation is really important, even if you're not getting active participation. Because I, you know, I, I kept telling my team, even if they aren't coming, you know, we need to make sure that they know what's going on um, and they understand what's happening so that as things progress, they aren't surprised when something comes up. Um, so we have you know, done some things where we attended city council meetings and making sure that the mayor is copied on minutes from our meetings and invited to public events and those sorts of things. But um, I, I think we really did focus, instead of focusing on getting people interested who weren't interested, let's, let's get that new generation of leaders, leaders involved. Let's cultivate those people who might be in those positions in the future and help them understand the power of the community engagement techniques that we're developing and the community knowledge that they're gaining about what people want and what people need. And then let's let that kind of bubble up through the official channels, maybe even in unexpected ways that aren't officially part of Heart and Soul. Um, but, but every community is different again. So some communities we've had very good representation from elected officials. So yeah, it just, it just kind of uh, varies from town to town, I guess. 
Yeah, thanks. And Debbie, do you have thoughts from Galesburg? Yeah, we have been very involved and engaged with our city leaders from the very beginning. Part of our project has been funded or was funded by the, the city. So they had a vested interest in the success of this program and this project. Um, I would, at our summit in March, we had a really large community summit. The mayor was there and he spoke. We also were represented, or we had a couple representatives from city council. That was terrific. Um, but I would say more than anything right now, the city is going through a comprehensive plan process, both as an overarching general comprehensive plan and also for parks and recreation. And they brought in and hired a consultant from Chicago and we have shared almost all of our information as much as possible with the consultants so that as they craft this comp plan, um, the needs and concerns of the community and of residents are right there built into the comp into the future of, of Galesburg. So, um, and I have to tell you that the consultants, I suppose theoretically could have fought us, but they have welcomed everything that we've shared because we've been able to engage people so deeply through heart and soul. Whereas, you know, when you're a consultant group, you come in, you have a few key focus groups and then you go back and you write your plan. So this is one way to hopefully ensure that the new comprehensive plan won't just sit on a shelf as we have heard happens sometimes in places, but it will actually be used and implemented in a deep way in hopefully over the next 20, you know, 10 to 20 years. So that's, that's been our engagement to date with the formal leadership. Right. Yeah, that's and, great, and, thank you. And Caitlin, if you don't mind, is uh, um, that just sparked uh, something for me as well. Um, so our council was actually, like I said, really has some great buy-in, but they also wanted to ensure that the, these values and this work didn't get lost. You know, they have term limits, staff turns over, that they did want to make sure that it continues. And so one project we did fairly early on was uh, community values alignment. We actually brought in a couple of graduate students from University of Colorado um, who took all of these community values, all the things that people said were important to them, and tried to align it with the city's code, you know, to the extent of saying, okay, well, these things you say in zoning, uh, these, these are in alignment with the community. Uh, these things you say in zoning, you know, weren't really identified. And, and these things you say in your zoning code actually go against what people value. And so we, we took this community values alignment, and we're actually rewriting our land use code right now. And that was actually one of the first documents we shared with our consultant as well. So, so the idea is, you know, that, that it is this community grows, e even if you don't show up to the meeting, you should be able to trust that the, the development decisions that are made are in alignment with your values because we already put them into the code. So it, it's one of the more cutting edge things we did, although probably 49 of the 50 people on the webinar are asleep when I started talking about it. But still, it was um, from city manager world, it was pretty innovative and pretty exciting. And uh, I, I think it's a way of ensuring that this thing lasts far beyond the players. Super, thanks. And Shane, I think that's such a cool project. So you have one, one fan at least. Um, so we're almost at the end of our webinar, but I did want to see if anybody had any last thoughts or comments before we turn it back to Matt to tell everybody what's next. <laughs> no, great. Well, thanks so much to all of you who joined us today. I hope you were inspired by our heart and soul stories. And Matt, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caitlin. And uh, thanks to Shane and Debbie and Jason. We're so grateful for your all's time and for, I mean, what was a really amazing, wide ranging conversation about how we work together to cultivate shared values and out of that process find those common goals. We're, we're so grateful for y'all's time. And um, you know, just, just in closing, on behalf of Art of the Rural and the Rural Policy Research Institute, we'd like to offer our thanks um, to all of you and uh, to everyone who's joined us from across the country in the last hour um, to listen in and I think really take a lot of valuable nuggets and act actionable items out of this conversation today. So we're grateful for everyone around the country who joined us as well. And I just want to express our thanks again to the National Endowment for the Arts, the McKnight Foundation, and USA World Development for making this conversation possible in the first place. We're grateful to those partners. Um, so Shane, Debbie, Jason, and Caitlin, thank you so much again. I hope you all and hope everybody out there in the internet world 
has an awesome afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.